Hey guys, how you doing? Oh, this one's going on. Just getting myself emotionally prepared. So welcome, guys. Good to see you. I had scheduled this earlier in the day, but circumstances changed. So this is a late nighter. It's 11 p.m. New York time, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 p.m. Michigan time. So that means in Australia, certain parts of Europe, it should be afternoon, evening. But I know in the UK, it's probably, what, five in the morning. But welcome. Folks, do me a favor. <clears throat> Pass on the links. Share the links on your social media pages. If you believe that these sessions are truly used of the Holy Spirit to educate brothers and sisters in Lord Jesus Christ, then share it on your social media pages. Invite folks to come. And then pray with me that the Holy Spirit in Jesus' almighty name will anoint the session, will anoint my mouth, my words to speak perfectly, accurately, without error, without stammering, without confusion, and glorify our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our hearts and minds to understand these issues and to recall the facts perfectly for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for the praise of men. And then also make sure once we begin... We're not going to engage in side issues or side talks in the comment section. This is like a class setting, a class session where I ask the Holy Spirit to use me, and he's the teacher, we're the disciples, for the glory of our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. So welcome, everybody. How you guys doing? Because it's a class session, I'm going to be inviting your comments, participation, because I want to make sure that you're understanding the issues, you're following along, and that by the grace of the Holy Spirit, it's sinking in because everything perfect and good is from the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. All mistakes and errors and sins come from us, right? So the Holy Spirit, who is perfect, uses imperfect vessels to preach his perfect word, right? So welcome, Nathan. Invite more folks. Uh, unfortunately, we are in the midst of a war, and it may trigger World War III. By the way, Anthony, you had asked a question in yesterday's stream. If you want me to answer it, maybe I'll Skype you, or you can Skype me, and I can answer it more thoroughly. We didn't have really time to engage it, but come back to the issue at hand. We are in a war, folks. There's a war taking place. Russia invading Ukraine, and there are civilians who are suffering, civilians who are being <clears throat> left homeless, fleeing from their homes, abandoning their homes, because they'd rather flee than live under Russian yoke, Russian rule, and people are dying. <clears throat> people are getting killed because of <clears throat> these senseless wars, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the Father, Son, who became flesh, the eternal companion of the Holy Spirit, already prophesied there'll be wars and rumors of wars, and this will continue until the Lord Jesus Christ descends physically, bodily from heaven to judge the living and the dead. May the Lord Jesus return sooner than later, and may we be filled with the Holy Spirit to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly love the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly cling and cleave, cleave to the Lord Jesus Christ and perfectly trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have perfect faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the Holy Spirit control our tongue, all our tongues, my tongue, our mouths, and the words of our tongues, and the Holy Spirit guard our mouths by his infinite power that no wicked, filthy, blasphemous, idolatrous <clears throat> word will come out of our tongues that we'll never betray or deny or blaspheme or disown our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ that our tongues will be guarded by the Spirit to proclaim our love for our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, even unto death in Jesus' name. Yeah, we're off the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, sadly, this may trigger a world war because the world is getting involved, which means we may be going through some very tumultuous times, but... We trust in the Holy Spirit to seal us, to preserve us, to guard us, and destroy our sinful passions, our sinful lusts, destroy every idle, idolatrous attachment to this world, 
to die to the world and live for our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the Holy Spirit empower us to hate Satan with perfect hatred and resist him with perfect resistance and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ with perfect submission and plead the blood of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to shield us, our loved ones, my daughters, against the evil one in Jesus' name. So it's unfortunate. So pray. Pray for the people who are suffering. More people are going to suffer. It's not just Russia. Watch what I'm going to say. We can Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just Russia. It's not just Ukraine. Other nations will be getting involved. Soldiers will be sent. More lives will be sacrificed, right? So let's ask the Lord to bless. Yalvar Rafa, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yalvar Rafa, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yalvar Rafa, Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the Alpha, 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 Spirit. Holy Spirit, bless the internet connection, the audio and visual qualities, and please strengthen my throat, invigorate my throat, grant my throat perfect health, and my arteries and my heart, my lungs and chest, the, the health that I need from you, O Lord, and giver of life, the breath of life, the eternal spirit of the Father and the Son. Strengthen my voice and make it passionate and perfect my ability to recall the scriptures and the facts related to scriptures perfectly, accurately, without error, without stammering, without stuttering, without confusion, and may I not be a distraction to my gracious host. Bless him, Holy Spirit, for serving me for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, and bless all your servants. Bring them and grant me contentment to do it for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for numbers or money or fame, reputation. And feed us the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ and give us the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation, our redemption, our food, our protection. And make us whole and heal us, Holy Spirit, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heal our loved ones. Feed our loved ones. Save our loved ones. Nourish our loved ones. In my case, my daughters, even their mother, convict her. Be a holy fire convicting her until she completely submits to the Lord Jesus Christ. Make us whole spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. Guide this session. Bless this session. This session we give to you. This ministry is yours. Our lives we give to you. The lives of my daughters, our loved ones, we give to you, Holy Spirit. Own us completely and fully and do not allow us to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. So please anoint me to say the words you want me to say and not stumble and sin and cause people to stumble or <clears throat> they cause me to stumble. Save us from Satan and his children. Muzzle them, teach them the fear of the Lord Jesus. And have your way with us. May the Lord Jesus sit and throne upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters, our hearts, his everlasting throne. So magnify your love, the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart. Use me, use us to glorify Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Good to see you guys. Okay, folks, a lot to cover. A lot to cover. Let's regroup. Let's focus. No side issues, no side tangents. There's a lot of clips to play. We're going to play some clips. Today, I had the misfortune of listening to a pastor named Pastor Bob Roberts, a pastor of a Baptist church in Dallas, Texas, who was invited by Yasser Qadi in his mosque. And we're going to play some clips, clips that should trouble you. And by the way, all the links to the clips and to the rebuttals related to the session are in the description box. Lord Jesus willing, when the session's over, I will then pin them as a comment. So you can find them in the description box and in the comment. The comment section will come later. So, but before I do that, I want to play something interesting. Now, tell me who you think this is. So, guys, we're now beginning the session. Please don't be distracted and ask the Holy Spirit to save me from distraction so we can glorify our triune God, Father, Holy Spirit, as we destroy all these satanic religions, ideologies, and take every thought captive and bring it to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's begin. Tell me who this sounds like, but I want to play just a small snippet. Listen to this. Okay, you guys ready? 
Are we in the saddle? Are we ready to begin? That means if you say yes, that means you're going to be focused. Ask Holy Spirit to help you to focus and not let Satan distract you. We got, we ready? All right. Let's listen to this. Listen carefully. 17 minute, 40 second mark. It's less than two minutes. Listen to the admission by this gentleman. Listen carefully. It's about the magisterial reformers. What did the reformers like John Calvin, Martin Luther teach? Listen from the horse's mouth. My, my argument was that the belief in the perpetual Virginia Mary was an error from the, from the beginning, biblically without question, without question. It was an error, even though I'm, I'm seeing, you've seen them, seen them too. I've, I've commented on one of them. These allegedly now formerly reformed people going, well, you know, I had never really thought about that. Well, then we should be talking about it more often. We, we should be going back over why we are what we are. Maybe we stopped doing that. I didn't, but maybe everybody else did. And the point was Listen to this. that it's not a direct parallel. The point is that we need to have the freedom to continue the examination. And if we discover that some of our reformed forebears Listen to this. accepted, for example, the extended assertion of simplicity ad intra and not just ad extra, then you can't cite the authority of the original reformers as, well, they looked through it all and Listen to this. therefore you're rejecting their authority if you dared question this. I don't see where they did. I don't see where they did. And I'm not, I am in no way uh, uh, denigrating Luther's uh, history and, and, and standing by saying he was wrong on the issue of the perpetual Virginia Mary. Am I? Didn't think it was, but. Okay, you catch it? That's a 17 minute, 40 second mark to the 19 minute, 15 second mark, approximately from James White's latest dividing line, which appeared five hours ago. Short follow-up on Aquinas, TR, onlyism, and the OPC. So did you hear what he just admit from the horse's mouth? Did you hear what he admit? He admit the magisterial reformers, Martin Luther and others, affirmed the perpetual virginity of Mary, and he thinks they were gross error biblically, as if his knowledge of scripture and history surpasses theirs. But he admitted it from the horse's mouth. So it was the dividing line. Several hours earlier, let me look at when exactly it was. All right, it's right here. Awesome. It's five hours ago streamed. Short follow-up on Aquinas, TR, Texas Receptus Onlyism, and the OPC, Orthodox Presbyterian Church. So he admitted it. He's admitting it. Now, the, the particular section I was quoting from is that he's now having to deal with Reformed Calvinists especially Reformed Baptist, because he's a Reformed Baptist, insisting that Reformed Calvinists need to rediscover Thomas Aquinas' view of God being simple, divine simplicity, divine simplicity. And they're saying that you won't have a proper understanding of the Trinity if you do not understand Aquinas' <clears throat> Articulation of divine simplicity. Divine simplicity. Now, don't ask me what that is. Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to have to start studying it sooner than later with your prayers. If you're praying for me and asking Lord Jesus and grant me and my daughter's perfect, miraculous physical safety and protection and health. But more importantly, granting me the holiness to delight the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, being a doer of his word, not a hypocrite. Never shame or dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ, but truly love Jesus. Love my Lord Jesus. Love our Lord Jesus by our deeds, proving to the Lord Jesus when no one's watching that we love him and we're not hypocrites. And the Lord bless my children that they fall in love with Jesus Christ and God preserve them. I'm going to have to study divine simplicity because it's becoming a hot topic. You have many who reject it, saying that it is not biblical, nor is it historical, and it ends up introducing heresies others say no if you properly understand divine simplicity it is biblical and historical but again i'm not a philosopher it's above my pay grade but i do want to understand what is divine simplicity 
And what are the problems with it or what are the positives? Well, James White doesn't know when to just shut up and disappear because he thinks he's God's gift to the church and he has to pontificate on everything. He has to pontificate on textual transmission. He has to pontificate on divine simplicity. He has to pontificate on Islam because he really thinks he's God's gift to the church. He really does. And everyone speaks out against him. Everyone criticizes him. And everyone agrees, Jimmy, you are inept. You don't have the intelligence. You don't have the qualification to address these issues. You keep embarrassing yourself because you keep opening your mouths. Your mouth, not mouths, but the way he's at it, you think he's got like 10 million mouths. You keep opening your mouth and talk about issues that you end up humiliating and embarrassing yourself because you don't know what you're talking about. You're inept. You're not that intelligent. You're not that smart. And every time you say something, you only expose that you are a joke and a charlatan. I'm being honest. And it's not me saying it. It's Reformed Calvinists, Reformed Baptists, and Evangelical Arminians and Provisionists. It's not just Catholics or Orthodox. They're all coming together. So he's great in that he's unifying all of them. He's bringing them all together, people of various theological backgrounds, philosophical backgrounds, all agreeing and uniting on this one point. James White, you are inept. You're a clown. You're a charlatan. You keep thinking you're God's gift to apologetics, and you keep pontificating on areas that show that you really are for lack of a better term, stupid and not qualified. And I'm not being mean. It's go there, go watch, go to Twitter and see. Reformed Calvinists, Reformed Baptists, Evangelical Arminians, Provisionists, right? Because he thinks he's scholarly enough to address Molinism, divine simplicity, and a host of other issues. And that's okay. This is a sign of God's judgment, folks. I've said this. So you need to pray for one another and pray for me. A sign of God's judgment is God hands you over to your pride and arrogance to destroy you, deservedly so, and in the process makes you look stupid and raises up people to expose how stupid you are, how arrogant you are, and that you become useless. And that's James White. I'm sorry to say this. You may get offended at me. The fear is we can follow that path of destruction and fall into the same snare. And I'm being honest when I say this. I'm, I don't think I'm better than James White. I'm not. And I am capable of being just as arrogant and proud as he, unless the Holy Spirit saves me from myself. And the Holy Spirit then hands me over and makes me stupid. God forbid, I fear the Lord's displeasure of me. I want Jesus to be happy with me because I want to make the Lord Jesus happy because he is our God. He is our existence. He is our life and our love. We cannot love him enough and praise him enough. And we never want the Lord to get to a point with us where he hands us over because of our pride or arrogance or willful sin and makes us stupid and shame us. God forbid. And not because of people's opinion. These people were going to die. We're going to die. Their opinion doesn't matter. It's the Lord Jesus because he ever lives and we're going to stand before him. But I just wanted you to hear that from the horse's mouth. He admit the reformers taught the perpetual virginity of Mary. But in his arrogance, they were wrong, but he's right. Because he discovered something that no other Christian before him discovered. They read the same Bible, right, in the original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. But they could not see what James White sees, though they're reading the same Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. See, these guys didn't know. They had to wait for James White to be born. You see the arrogance? It's repulsive. It's disgusting. May the Lord Jesus save us from our own wickedness, pride, and arrogance, and sinfulness. And we don't follow into the same snare of James White. So, yep, they didn't have logos. You're right. I'm sorry. I forgot. They didn't have logos. You're right, Christ is King. They didn't have accordance. They didn't have logos. Right? All right? Now, with that said, let's go to this other heartbreaking. Sargon D, Lord Jesus willing, I'm back next Tuesday.
I'll send you the time if you can pick me up. Confirm, brother, if you can. I appreciate you, brother. You know, especially uh, when you pick me up. I appreciate you a lot more. When you don't pick me up, I don't appreciate you as much. You know, after all, what are brothers for? You know, we use each other. Man, look at me. Pray in Jesus' name. I keep the weight off, stay lean and fit and be holy unto the Lord Jesus Christ. For the glory of Jesus Christ, unto his glory and praise. May I do all things for his glory and not out of selfish motive. Now, if you thought that was troubling, let's now go to this other clip. Oh, by the way, if you guys have been following me, you know I'm a big Batman fan. I love Batman. Love Bruce Lee. Loved Hulk Hogan. I used to be a Hulkamaniac. Arnold Schwarzenegger. These were like the biggest influences because I got into martial arts and bodybuilding. So Bruce Lee, Hulk Hogan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Batman. Of the four, Batman and Bruce Lee are my favorite. Right? And may the Lord Jesus Christ cleanse me of all idolatry and destroy every idol in my life. If that's Bruce Lee, may that idol be destroyed from me completely. That I have no idols between me and my love for the Lord Jesus Christ. But I mention that because I saw the movie, Batman movie today. Batman. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? You want my opinion of the Batman film? You guys ready to hear my opinion? In my estimation, no, I'm not going to give you any scenes. And I'm a huge Batman fan. I like the first Michael Keaton Batman. I like. I, I guess I liked all of them. But Michael Keaton wasn't my preferred choice. I love the Christian Bale versions of Batman. I thought he was phenomenal. Those Batmans, the best. This Batman, in my estimation, is every bit as good as the Christian Bale version, if not better. It was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, that's my assessment. You may disagree with me. I loved it. I would say it is the best Batman, right? It's up there with Christian Bale's, you know, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight. I forget the other two, but phenomenal. Those Batmans with Christian Bale were the best, but this is every bit as good, if not better. I absolutely loved it. It, it came from a different angle, a different perspective, and a very young-looking Batman. The, the actor, I thought, what a rotten choice for a Batman. He rocked it. And the Catwoman, she rocked it. So, excellent film, right? Excellent film. Now, with that said, let's go to the other heartbreak, disastrous heartbreak. You ready? All righty, then. Here we go. I, I yes. have to write down certain timestamps. Certain timestamps. This comes from Yasser Qadi's own YouTube channel. It was premiered. 14 hours ago, he had a pastor named Bob Roberts discussing his outreach to Muslims. And the title is Muslims and Evangelicals Bridging the Chasm, Chasm, even though it's a CH, Chasm, Chasm. Muslims and Evangelicals Bridging the Chasm, a dialogue between Dr. Yasser and Pastor Roberts. This is Pastor Bob Roberts. He's a pastor of a Baptist church in Dallas, Texas. So let's listen. Okay, At the, I have I have a few clips, timestamps that we're going to be listening to. Okay, now you tell me your opinion. I'm not. I don't want my opinion, but I may share mine. Hold on, let's see. We're going to go to the nine minute forty two second mark. That's the first clip. Nine minute forty two second mark. Okay, let's go there. Let's get it. All right, here we go. I start a couple of seconds earlier. Different ideology, Listen. and so as a result, we disagree and we compete with one another. Listen. I don't think that's bad. Listen to this. I think what's bad is when we vilify one another. I have something I teach young pastors. Never, never, never trash another religion. Listen if the only way your religion can be strong is to destroy another religion or to stay isolated from other religions because they'll infect you, you must have an awful weak faith. 
Some of my pastor friends got upset that I would let Muslims come to our church, that I would let my children be with Muslims. What's that is? My kids are close to Muslims. They're adult kids now. They go to Ramadan, everything. Ramadan. My little grandkids love Ramadan. I love them. My grandkids love Ramadan. They don't understand they can't eat all day. The, the Christian part of them starts early in the morning. But when they go to the Ramadan, it kicks in. But here's what I want you to understand. In the differences that we face, we have to realize that when we work together and those differences are there, okay. we can live together. Okay. So he counsels pastors. I said I don't want to chime in and give you my view, but, you know, I can't help it. So forgive me. I can't help it. I have to say something. He counsels pastors never attack another religion. In other words, his view of Christianity, if you're truly a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're confident in your faith, then you won't attack another religion. So that means I should never highlight how grossly immoral, evil, and filthy and wicked Muhammad was for his pedophilia, his adultery, his polygyny, having captive women raped, even married women taken captive could be raped. So it's both rape and adultery. Don't talk about any of that because to attack another religion means you must be weak in your faith. And then he takes pride that his grandchildren celebrate Ramadan. So he just told you, this pastor of a Baptist church in Dallas, Texas, Pastor Bob Roberts, he takes pride that he and his family celebrate a pagan fast, Ramadan, break fast with Muslims in honor of a pagan god, Allah of the Quran, who's not the God of the Bible, and then being yoked with demons because Paul tells us sacrifices titles are sacrifices to demons. So when you go and break fast with Muslims and worship with Muslims and honor their festivities, you are now having fellowship. You're in communion with that demon, if not Satan himself, because Allah's either a very high-ranking demon, or Satan himself who appeared to Muhammad to deceive him into thinking he is the God of the Bible. You got it? So he's he's proud of that. So now let's skip to the 11-minute mark. And by the way, the link is in the description box. So let's go to the 11-minute mark. Listen to this. Listen to this. Going in anyhow to stand by this particular person. So I did. I go to mosques frequently. All right. Do y'all mind? I'm, I'm curious. Listen. I go. I always tell the imam I'm there. You're always welcome to come visit our church. And so he stood up and he started talking. He's preaching a hard song. You need to be righteous. You need to be holy. You need to act good. Because if you don't, your kids are going to get on drugs. They're going to become Christians. And you're going to ask, where did I fail? And <laughs> I did, I wanted to laugh, but I could not. What's that? Is? You know, because I, because I could not. I've heard that same sermon. Except your kids are going to become Muslims. All right. Do you, do you understand? So I think the fear, okay. I think the anger uh, of, of Islam is real. But let me okay. Did you hear what he said? So I go to a mosque and the Muslim says, if you don't teach your children and protect them, they'll become Christians. And he goes, I've heard the same sermon, but in churches where the Christian says your children will be Muslims and that's bad. You mean Christians warning parents that if you don't teach your children the truth, about Jesus Christ our Lord, all the overwhelming, massive scientific facts, historical, textual, archaeological confirmation of the historical accuracy of the Bible, miraculous prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, and the historicity of the resurrection, so they can know the Bible is true and Christianity is true and Jesus Christ is Lord and their only hope of salvation. If you don't teach them that, then they become Muslims, and that's bad? That's bad? That's somehow bad to warn parents your Christian, your children may become Muslims or atheists? Really? Is this guy serious? Okay, but now let's go to the 13 minute, 20 second mark. 13 minute, 20 second mark. Okay? Watch this. Okay, let's go here. All right, right here. Listen to this. Evangelicals to help them as well just tone down. I mean, 
of course, we want everybody to convert, but as, at least don't hate us, don't stereotype us. Even if you're going to remain Christian, I'd much rather a faithful Christian who loves and cares about me than somebody of whatever faith who hates me and wants to kill me, right? Did you, did you hear this? Did you hear the narcissist, the Asakati? This is what we call narcissism. I'd rather have an evangelical Christian who loves me than someone who wants to kill me. You're actually scared of Christians killing you, Yasser Qadi? You, a Muslim who follows Muhammad and his jihadis, who spread Islam violently all over the world, something he himself admitted that they spread, it, spread Islam offensively, not just in defensive wars. And you are afraid of evangelical Christians killing you? Are you serious? You're afraid evangelical Christians who truly love Jesus Christ, know the Lord Jesus Christ, who are not allowed to murder people simply because they reject the gospel. They're allowed to defend their lives, protect their lives from you and your ilk because your God tells you you can murder us and enslave us and rape our women and children. Do we have a right to defend ourselves physically if it means we have to take guns and protect our lives? Yes. The Bible says self-defense is an option for Christians. And you're the one, you're the one that's worried about evangelicals killing you? Are you serious? This is narcissism. Guys, do me a favor. Study narcissistic personality disorder. And I don't say this to slander. I'm trying to be honest. James White has narcissistic personality disorder. May I not have that in Jesus' name? May none of you have it. Narcissistic personality disorder. Study it. You'll see the symptoms. What a narcissist does is they will villa, they will bully you. They will terrorize you. They will demonize you. They will belittle you. They will humiliate you in order to control you and enslave you to themselves. But when you stand up to the bully, then they play the victim. And then they vilify you. Did you hear this? You're afraid of evangelical trying to kill you? There is no true evangelical who is in love with the Lord Jesus Christ that will murder anyone simply because they have refused to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not the same. That's not the same as defending your life. You can defend yourself. If a Muslim breaks into my house and wants to rape my children, you know I have a right if I have a weapon to send them to meet their maker, the Lord Jesus Christ, in judgment, because we have a right to protect our lives, to protect the innocent, the helpless, the marginalized, and our lands against threats of people who come who want to rape our women and children, enslave our women and children, and murder us. Or We have a right. We don't have a right to murder someone who doesn't accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we don't have a right. This man has the audacity to say he's afraid of evangelicals. My goodness, it's disgusting. Now let's go to the 18 minute, 49 second mark. 18 minute, 49 second mark. Watch this. Disgusting what I'm hearing. And this pastor, listen, to, oh, it's going to get worse. Listen to 18 minute, 49 second mark. Here we go. Okay, here we go. The Bible never says God gets upset when we work with other people that are non-Christians to help them, even if they don't want to convert. And my conversion Listen. rate in Afghanistan was pretty much non-existent. Did you hear it? He went to Afghanistan and helped build schools, hospitals, orphanages. Glory to the triune God, Father, and Spirit. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to love people by our deeds. Praise God for that work. But he's boasting he didn't convert a single Afghani to Christianity. My conversion, zero. And he's boasting. He's boasting about that. Yes, we will build hospitals, orphanages, schools to improve the quality of life of people because we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we will take pride. We're doing it because we love the Lord Jesus Christ and he commands us to love you and provide for you. And our hope is you give your life to Jesus Christ. But if you don't, we are not going to throw you out of the hospital or the orphanages or schools. We'll still love you. Practically, but we want you to know we do it because of the Lord Jesus and he loves you and he's your only hope of salvation. But he's boasting my conversion rate, zero. Did you hear it? Listen. All One right. More time. You're building schools and hospitals. That's what we, but I thought WWPD, Listen. what would the Apostle Paul do? 
And I thought, these are imams I'm working with, not Christian Listen, pastors. And I'm going to do work with them. And I thought, would God get upset with me? The Bible never says God gets upset when we work with other people that are non-Christians to help them, even if they don't want to convert. And my conversion rate in Afghanistan was pretty much non-existent. Non-existent. All right? Zero. You're building schools. Zero. Non-existent. And he's boasting about it. Now let's go to 19 minutes, 16 second mark. Watch here. Let's go here. Listen. I heard the call to prayer in my life. Listen to this. Was, I had been driving all He's day. He's talking about the Adhan. When he first heard the Adhan, the, the call to prayer, look at what he says. Long across the desert. I was exhausted. And I'd come straight from an airplane to, I don't need to tell you where I went. But anyhow, I get to that place. And all of a sudden, four in the morning, is that when it happens? I heard that. Ah! I mean, I just jumped up and I thought, Where, where's our guard? You know, I, I, you thought it's an attack. Scared. Yeah, listen, I mean, listen, I, listen. it's coming out over the speaker. <clears throat> and then somebody explained to me what it means. Hmm. Did you know I actually like listening to the call to prayer now? Did you hear that? Now, the problem is I tell some of my evangelical friends, they freak out over that. Listen, I, I'm not going to be a Muslim. Please don't be offended. I'll be submitted to God. Inshallah one day. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inshallah. And, and, you know Inshallah, right? I do. I do. <laughs> and, I, and I do respect the Prophet Muhammad. I do respect the Prophet Muhammad. He called him a prophet. I do respect the Prophet Muhammad, and I like the call to prayer. I like the call to prayer. And I do respect the Prophet Muhammad. I don't feel it necessary to belittle him in any way. I've read two biographies about I don't feel the need to belittle him. So let's not talk about him being a pedophile who destroyed a nine-year-old mi minor psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and physiologically, leaving her a widow at 18, and then damning her soul to hell. Let's not talk about that because, you know, I don't feel the need to criticize him. Or that he allowed his jihadis to take women captive and rape them because now they're their property of the Muslims and the women have no choice, even if they're married. Or that he prostituted women, treated like whores, calling it temporary marriage. Let's not talk about that. No, let's not talk about that. About him. I'm about to read my third biography about him. Okay, here, let's hear that one more time. I want you to hear the shock. And I got to turn off the air conditioning. It's freezing here. One more time. Listen. He likes the call to prayer. Okay, watch here. One more time. Listen. I heard the call to prayer in my Listen. life. Was I had been driving all day long across the desert. And I was exhausted. And I'd come straight from an airplane to, I don't need to tell you where I went. But anyhow, I get to that place. And all of a sudden, four in the morning, is that when it happens? I heard that, hello. Ah! I mean, I just jumped up and I thought, where, where's our guard? You know, I, I, you thought it's an attack. Scared. Yeah. I mean, I was coming out over the speaker <clears throat> and then somebody explained to me what it means. Listen, did you know, I actually like listening to the call to prayer now. Did you hear? I like the call to prayer where Muslims five times a day will be reciting verses in the Quran, cursing Jews and Christians and Proclaiming another Jesus, another Mary, another God, another spirit, another gospel, right? <clears throat> and accusing Christians of being idolaters for worshiping three gods. Yeah. Now, the problem is, I tell some of my evangelical friends, they freak out over that. I, I'm not going to be a Muslim. Please don't. Do you blame the evangelical friends of his for getting upset with him? I'll be offended. I'll be submitted to Inshallah God. one day. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah, one day. inshallah. And, and, you know Inshallah, right? I do. I do. <laughs> and, I, and I do respect the Prophet Muhammad. I don't feel it necessary to belittle him mm -hmm. in any way. I've read two biographies about him. I'm about to read my third biography about him. So I do respect the Prophet Muhammad. I do respect the Prophet Muhammad. Did you catch it? He called him a prophet. And he says he respects him. And he doesn't feel the need to belittle him. And now he's going, he's reading the third biography about him. You caught it? Okay. Now let's go to the 20 minute 45 second mark. Watch here. Okay, watch here. Furthermore, here's what got me in a lot of trouble, Gossip. Gossip got me. I started standing up for religious freedom in America. 
for Muslims. That got him in trouble. It got me in trouble that I was standing up for religious freedoms for Muslims. Now watch what he says here. Watch what he does. And we lost hundreds of people from our church. Bob Glory to Jesus Christ. Praise the triune God. May he shut you down. Praise Jesus Christ for those evangelicals that left your church. Why are you doing that? I mean, Christians are persecuted around the world. I said, yeah, they are. And Muslims are persecuted in America. And if we want religious... Did you hear, did you hear what this wicked tool of the devil said? He likens Muslim persecution in America to the persecution of Christians in Muslim lands. See what this demon just said? You, did you catch it? Do you hear what he just said, right? When the evangelicals told him Christians are being persecuted in Muslim lands, he goes, yeah, they are. And Muslims are being persecuted in America. Are you serious? Is there a moral equivalency to the way Muslims are persecuted in America, to the way Christians are persecuted in Muslim countries? In Pakistani, you have Christians who are being accused of blasphemy because according to the blasphemy law, they can be imprisoned and killed. In Egypt, you got Coptic girls being kidnapped by Muslims, being raped and married off to Muslim men, and their families can't do a damn thing about it. Did you guys know this? I don't know if you know this. Ask any Egyptian. And by the way, Egypt is in Africa. It's not Arabia. It's not Arab. Ask any Egyptian. Ask our brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ whether evangelical or Coptic, what is happening to our Christian sisters in Egypt, Coptic girls and evangelical girls being kidnapped by Muslims, being raped and married off to Muslim men, and the Christian families can't do a darn thing about it, but have to accept it. Because in Islam, Muslim men can marry Christian women. Do you guys know this is happening in Egypt? You guys know that? Is this similar to the way Muslims are being persecuted in America? Last time I checked, the liberal me media back bends over backwards for Muslims. It's Christianity that's under attack. Right? You see what he said? You see what a pathetic excuse of a human being this guy is? And he's a pastor of a church. It's freedom. For ourselves, we've got to provide it for everyone else. And furthermore, is our faith so weak that Look we're afraid of another religion being present? You catch it again? You see the the satanic appeal to emotion? Is our faith so weak? But no, no, you wicked, filthy, spiritual dog. Let me tell you what it is. The rights you afford to Muslims will allow them to increase to such an extent that when they have the upper hand, they will then subjugate you and enslave your children and women and impose Sharia on you. Go look what happened. What's happening in UK? You wicked, vile spiritual dog. I'm sorry, guys. I get animated. I was trying to. Go, I was going to try to control myself, but this man claims to be a Christian. So, Bob, you Listen. actually faced criticism from your own congregation for speaking out for Muslim rights in America. A lot of it. It was very hard. very hard. It was very hard. And you lost people from your church. Hundreds. Hundreds. Wow. Glory hundreds. to Jesus Christ for those hundreds. I, I um, Yeah. And they thought that I'd, you know, compromised my faith. So can I? Can I yeah. And they just, can I tell you? Listen, I didn't compromise my faith. Listen to this. Listen. They thought I compromised my faith because he thinks there's only one way to compromise your faith. Only one way. If I deny Jesus Christ is God and he died on the cross for my sins, the Bible is God's word. That's compromise. No, no, no. Satan is more subtle and conniving than that. There are other ways you ended up denying your faith, you wicked tool of the devil, and yet you think you're a Christian. God have mercy on me. I'm getting angry. I apologize, guys. I just be candid with you. Can I tell you what we really believe? Don't get mad at me. He's even apologizing. Did you catch it? He's apologizing. He's, can I be very candid with you? Don't get mad at me. Please don't get mad at me. He's apologizing for what he's about to say. He's apologizing for what he's about to say. Are you listening? Can I be very candid with you? Don't get mad at me. It's like he's ashamed and he's got to apologize. So what is he apologizing for? Watch, watch, listen. 
So I told you we believe Jesus is God. We believe that he died for the sins of the world. And our mission is to tell people about Jesus. And they said, now you're saying that there are many ways to God. No, I have not changed my way to God. I, I still believe Jesus is the only way to God. I'm not going to say who's in heaven, who's out of heaven. That's up to God. You see how subtle and deceitful Satan works and his ministers? Jesus is God. He died on the cross for our sins. And the Bible is God's word. And he's the only way. But, you know, don't get mad at me now. Uh, when I tell you this, don't get mad at me. I want to be candid. But guess what? My conversion rate in Afghanistan, Afghanistan non-existent, didn't convert anybody. Even though Jesus is the only way. Who goes to heaven or hell? That's God's business. Jesus is the only way. And I haven't converted a single Muslim to the, to the only way of salvation. See? See how tricky, how conniving, how evil Satan and his instruments are, his ministers are? Right? They'll sound Christian enough to disarm you. But if you believe Jesus is the only way, why weren't you intentional about showing them why they should accept the Lord Jesus Christ? Why Islam is not an option because if they believe Islam wholeheartedly, they will experience the wrath of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially now that you are a minister presenting to them the truth of the gospel. Okay? Now let's go to the 22 minute, 55 second mark. Watch here. Wicked, man. Wicked. This is American churchianity, by the way. In a very clear listen, question, and we have to be this. again North frank North. in this conversation because I don't believe in, in 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 ignoring these elephants in the room. You're building schools, you're building hospitals, you're doing it because you're a Christian. But is are the services in those hospitals and schools contingent on them converting? Oh. Are you so you're building this because you think that's what a good Christian would do? Yeah, and it's yeah. open for everybody. Yeah. Because you do know that some groups they that build hospitals and schools in order to in order to spread Christianity via those mechanisms, right? I do, and I think that's wrong. And you do know Muslims do that too. So so I think we ought to serve people. We have a saying in our church. Listen to this. Serve not to convert. Not to convert. Serve because you've been converted. It sounds pious. Now that's a different motivation. Sounds biased. So the good that I do, it's not because I'm twisting your arm to be like me. Now I want to tell you, Mike. Okay, did you catch it? You see how pious and spiritual it sounds? You see why I warn you guys of fake piety, fake spirituality that is a cloak by Satan to deceive you and disarm you into thinking you're being Christ-like? You see that? <gasps> see, we serve not to convert. We serve because we are converted. <gasps> Sounds so pious and spiritual and humble. Gee, can I be like you, right? This is why you guys have to be wise, wise, wise as snakes, serpents, innocent as doves. Meaning, spot fake satanic piety and humility and spirituality. Don't fall for it. This is not biblical piety. This is not biblical humility, biblical spirituality. It's satanic because Satan will cloak, right, deceit, lies, and falsehood with piety, with humility, with humbleness and righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. And again, let me repeat. When I go out and I build an orphanage or a hospital or a school, I do it because Jesus tells me to love people by my deeds, not lip service. And do it for the glory of Jesus, telling them, look, it's because the Lord Jesus loves you. And because if I love Jesus, I am to obey him, I'm doing this. Because Jesus is your Lord and Savior who loved you so much to die for you and now lives and desires you to turn to him because he wants you to live in his presence forever. The Lord Jesus is the only hope of salvation. And that's why I'm doing it. Now, if you don't convert... I won't throw you out. You still can come to school. The orphanage is still a place for you. And the hospital will still treat you. But I want you to know I'm doing it because Jesus loves you. And he wants you to know that he's your only hope of salvation. He's the son of God. Right? That's true piety. That's how you do it. But if you don't accept, you don't throw them out. That You don't do that. That's wickedness. Now, what's ironic, coming from Yasser Qadi, the slob, 
Jimmy White's master and teacher, the one that Jimmy White invited to church and was just swooning all over. He knows that the Quran, chapter 9, verse 60, the Quran, guys, don't take my word for it, Surah Til Tilba, chapter 9, verse 60. There it says, when you collect zakat, alms, sadaqah, alms, charity, part of the alms that Muslims collect is to go towards enticing people whose hearts incline to Islam. Did you know that's one category? The alms, the zakat, the sadaqah, the money that the Muslims must give in charity. One of the groups that benefit from the alms is those whose hearts incline to Islam, meaning you can buy them off, which is why you have Muslims who will tell you, you become Muslim, we'll buy you a home. If you become Muslim, we'll get you a car. You become Muslim, we'll pay for your education. Because the Quran says you can use part of your almsgiving to entice people to become Muslim. That's in chapter 9, verse 60. And this wicked, filthy dog, Yasser Qadi, is complaining about Christians building orphanages, hospitals, or schools with the hopes of using that to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what a wicked son of the devil Yasser Qadi is? James White's master and teacher. Okay. That's chapter 9, verse 60. Christians, read chapter 9, verse 60. It's there. And read the commentaries. They all agree. Okay. A couple more clips. The 24 minute, 20 second mark. Listen to this 24 minute, 20 second mark. London. And I was with this very prominent, very wealthy Muslim businessman. Listen to this. And he came up to me and I became close friends to him. And we were there with some Muslim leaders and he started sobbing. He said, Bob, I cannot bear the thought of you in hell. We, no, don't laugh. Don't laugh. No, he don't said, laugh. I love Cry. you so much. Would you please consider Islam and would you convert? That was the greatest compliment that old man could have given me. Because you know what he was saying? Oh, I love you, Bob. I love you, Bob. And, and oh, I believe that there is one way that you go to heaven oh, and I don't want you to be in hell. Why would I not be honored by that? Why would that not be a respectful and a kind thing? It was to me. I love that man. You see, catch it? You see the fake piety? You see the satanic piety? You see the satanic piety? See Satan's is brilliant because he will cloak his lies, his deceit, his poison with piety, humility, humbleness, and righteousness. I love that man. The man was weeping for me, telling me, I, I love you so much. Be Muslim because if you don't become Muslim, then there's no way you're going to go to Jannah and have all these whores with big, huge tits. And again, I'm not exaggerating. It's chapter 78, verse 33 of the Quran. It says, the whores, that Muslims will have eternal erections, deflowering forever and ever. And Allah's whorehouse that makes the Playboy Mansion look like a monastery in comparison. It says they have firm breasts. Kawa'ib, atrab. Swelling, firm breasts. Allah doesn't like sagging tits. He likes tits that are solid and firm. So the whores that he created have solid, firm tits. Yeah, I'm not exaggerating. 7833, guys. Don't take my word for it. Yes, I want you to be Muslim so you can have an erect penis that will never, never go soft. Blast it. It's going to be hard. Bob, this is what I want for you, son. Bob, just say la, 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 Bob. Then you're going to have a hard penis that's going to stay erect forever and ever. And you're going to have these whores with huge tits, Bob. And they'll suckle you. And don't worry about it. If you suckle 10 times, that doesn't make you their son. You know, on earth, if a woman gives you her tit and you suck it 10 times or five times because it was abrogated, but remember that sheep ate the copy. Sorry about that. Allah failed to preserve that copy, which had the stoning birth and the five sucklings that abrogated the 10 sucklings. Oops, I guess the sheep was almighty over Allah, right? But put that aside. We won't talk about that, Bob. We ain't going to talk about that. Send it Ibn Majah. We ain't going to talk about it, Bob. We, what are we going to talk about, Bob? The tales? Here, here, Bob. Don't you want a hard penis? Allah's got super Viagra. A Viagra that is super. 
it's on a whole nother level because once he gives you his Viagra, you ain't never going to get soft, Bob. And you're going to have all these whores, Bob. And their tits are huge, Bob. And you're going to deflower them as whores. And maybe, maybe your mom is going to be with them because according to Allah's messenger, all these righteous women are going to be part of these whores. And then Muslim perverts are going to deflower them. Maybe your mom is going to be there. Or maybe your daughter, Bob. Yeah, Bob. That's what I want for you, son. Won't you become a Muslim? Yep. You caught it, guys? And I'm not exaggerating. 7833. They're going to have huge, firm tits. Yeah, it says it. Guys, don't take my word for it. And the Hadiths say that their penises will be hard, not placid. And they're going to deflower them. They're going to return virginal over and over and over again. Yeah, I'm not exaggerating. It's in the Quran and the Hadiths. Okay? Okay? So now let's go to 26 minute, 50 second mark. 26 minute, 50 second mark. Okay, here we go. He was he loved me, man. He loved me. That man loved me, man. He wanted me, he wanted me to just be a pimp daddy. Mac daddy pimp in paradise. That's what he wants for me. He wants me to be a pimp. So I can hoard these women. I mean, is there a greater love than that? The flowering horse? Thank you, thank you, Abdurrahman. Thank you. Get out. Let's listen. Knowing that there's so much tension between evangelicals and, and Muslims, and knowing we're the minority. We're the minority. And frankly, a lot of us are, are worried about the type of rhetoric that we see in the evangelical community. What practice? We are worried. We are worried. We Muslims, whose history is all about pillaging, raping, murdering people. Stealing lands of Jews and Christians in the name of Allah and his messenger. Something no Christian has a right to do, by the way. But be that as it may. But we're worried. Pakistani Christians being murdered because of blasphemy law. Where it just takes four Muslims, if that, to falsely accuse a Christian of blasphemy Muhammad. He goes to prison and he's killed. But we're worried. We're the ones worried. Right? Us. In Egypt, Coptic Girls, Christian girls in Egypt being kidnapped and raped and married off to Muslim men. But we're the ones worried. We're worried. ICE goes into Iraq, rapes Christian women and Yazidi women. But we're the ones who are worried. Us, us. In Syria, the same thing, right? Right? Forget about Boko Haram and all these other places like Shabab. And, but we're the ones worried. We're worried about evangelical rhetoric. We, poor Muslims, we innocent victims in the West. Jared, does this man not disgust you, this fat slob of the devil? Okay, 29 minute, 29 second mark. Here we go, and then we're done. This was it. But we're worried. Now watch this. Lord, Lord willing, if you guys are in Dallas, Texas, this Sunday, but you got to register on his church. It's Northwood Church, Dallas, Texas, Pastor Bob Roberts. He's got a huge mega event this Sunday in Dallas, Texas, which you got to register. Some of the biggest Muslim scholars and evangelical leaders are gathering together. Some of the biggest names in evangelical Christianity, leaders and Muslim leaders are gathering at a church Sunday around six o'clock. This Sunday, guys, Lord willing, it's not too late. If you're in Dallas, Texas, Northwood Church, Pastor Bob Roberts, register. Go there and be a voice a light of the Lord Jesus Christ exposing this filthy son of the devil, Muhammad. Now watch what he's going to say. He's now inviting them. 29 minute, 29 second mark. Watch what he says. Listen. Have a fair. You can walk around. There'll be Christian boots and Muslim boots. Nobody's going to try to convert you. All right. See that? So We're going to have a fair in my church. Muslim boots, Christian boots. And he's in a mosque. No one's going to try to convert you. Wait. You're telling me. You're going to host an event in your church. Muslim booths set up with Islamic literature. Christian booths. And you say to the Muslims, no one's going to convert you. So not only are you allowing Muslims to have booths there to spread their literature to weak Christians, gullible Christians, they trust you, you son of the devil. But you're telling them, don't worry, no one's going to convert you. No one's going to convert you, seriously? In the church? 
where you're supposed to preach the gospel to those who don't know the gospel or refuse to accept, and you encourage them, no one's going to convert you. Now listen. Well, there'll be booths you can walk around and look, and then we're going to have um, uh, a prayer space because there's a 631 prayer, but you got to go in there and pray and don't horse around. Did you catch it? Not only in his church, Northwood Church, Dallas, Texas, He's going to have Muslim booths spreading Muslim propaganda. And there are going to be some Christians who are Christians by name, weak in their faith, who don't know. We're going to pick up that literature. And they're going to end up leaving the Lord Jesus, whom they do not know. Because if you truly know Jesus, when you compare him to Muhammad, you'll piss on Muhammad. Your urine's better than him. Okay? But on top of that, he's making a space in his church. For them to pray to Allah of the Quran, who is Satan, or a high-ranking demon, I, I'm convinced it's Satan, praying prayers of blasphemy in his church, making space in his church, a Baptist church in Dallas, Texas, Northwood Church, Pastor Bob Roberts. Okay, there you go. Got it? And the link is here, Yasser Qadi, and here it is in the description box. There you go. You, that's where you got it. Pass this on to Christian Prince if you guys can. If you have his contact, let him do a session going through this as well. So there you go. This is the state of churchanity in the West. Now, thank the Lord Jesus for those evangelicals who left him, who spoke out against him, and saw what a satanic tool, tool of the devil he is. And he thinks he's honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? There you go. So there's the link. Now let's go into Sheikh Fibin and his lies concerning the satanic verses. Are we ready? Now let's segue into something else. All right, we're done with that. All right, let's go to... It's a short clip. We already addressed his claim about John 17 about a week ago or two. Wasn't too long ago. It's a short clip. I just want to address what he claims about the satanic verses. Quick question. Quick Before answer. Okay, here it goes. The clip is there in the description box. Good, let's go there. Let's see what he's going to claim. It's six minutes, seven seconds, but we're not going to listen to it because it's what he, he says about three daughters. Abdullah, come on. Listen. That he had three daughters. Abdullah, come on. I forgot the name. God had three daughters? Three daughters. Three daughters. Three daughters. It's not in the Quran or the Hadith. Oh, you heard about it. I'm not in the Quran or the Hadith. Notice, he says not in the Hadith. Okay. Let me answer. Let me answer. That was never in the Quran. Never. 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 Ever. Let me. Let me. Let me explain it. There are mushrikeen. You know the mushrikeen, the Quraysh, the people of Mecca who used to worship idols. Those that worship idols, they attributed to Allah daughters as a lie, right? And the Quran it condemns that. The Quran says they attribute to themselves, to themselves sons and to God, to daughters. Allah has no children. Lam yalid, lam yulad. He is not born of anybody, nor does he have any children. The Quran. I know. I was. There is nothing in the Quran or Hadith. Maybe, maybe it's a lie. People have made up. But, but those were the lies that were that were condemned. No, no, Allah is not a she, first off, right? It's, there's no moon god. No, but it's from his statues. His statues of Allah? Where is the statue of Allah? Where is the statue of Allah? We don't have statues. No, no, they don't have a black stone. That's not a statue. Even though Muhammad smothered it, kissed it, touched it, and wept on it, and they must do it as well. That's not a statue. That's not an idol. No, no, no. Because Muhammad said so. No, we don't have statues. No, 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 no. There was Lat. There was Lat. There was Uzza. There was Manat. There was no statue. I will explain it. The Muslims use the lunar calendar. You know, the, when they use the moon, right? From Jews as well. From that, some Muslims. Well. Yeah. Can I can I finish? Can I finish? Can I finish? This is why this guy doesn't debate and won't like 
a moderator control because he has to talk over you, dominate over you. That's the only way he can get away with it. Now, someone will say, I do the same thing. No, let me correct that lie because I get sick of correcting these wicked, filthy, slandering tools of the devil. When someone goes live with me, I know the tactics of the Muslims. I know when you ask a question, they will divert and not answer the question, which is why I corner them and bury them and do not let them move an inch. Even Christian Prince does that and he does it masterfully because I know how these cultists are and the Mohammedans are. They don't answer questions directly. They don't answer questions directly. They go on tangents. That's why I cut them off and I nail them. And I'll say, this is now the fourth time I ask you the question. But as far as moderated debates, I've already proven myself that I do moderated debates. I've had at least a dozen moderated debates. They're online, much of which we've uploaded. So if someone says, see, you can't, you can't debate fairly because you know you get refuted. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Every person that I have debated, all glory to the Chime God, glory to the Holy Spirit, Everyone I've debated, moderated debates, time speeches and rebuttals and cross-examination, glory to the triumph God, all glory to the Holy Spirit, I have pulverized and destroyed. So don't give me that lie. Even in moderated debates, they can't get away with lies because by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit enables me to destroy their lies and go for the spiritual juggler and wipe out their fake demonic doctrines for the glory of Jesus Christ. It's there, documented. I don't like debates because in time debates, the other party can get away with murder not answering questions. This is why I like when they call because I'll make sure they answer the question and they don't tap dance. Like I did with that Calvinist. You remember the Calvinist? Because he couldn't get away from my direct questions, had it been a moderate debate, he would have gotten away with murder. You had him admit, it's there two weeks ago, that he believes, God forbid such blasphemy, and thank the Lord Jesus, he saved me out of this wicked satanic system and showed me how blasphemous it is that I've repented of it. You heard him say he believes that God decreed that ICE, ISIL, ICE or ISIS, they go by various names, God decreed that they would rape women, even children, and murder the men and enslave women and children. God decreed it. He goes, yes, God decreed it. And then he admit that when I asked him, if God decreed that ICE would rape a woman, could they have chosen otherwise? He said, no. See, this is what you need to do to show how wickedly, filthy, demonic, blasphemous their teachings are. But in the moderated debate, they get away with murder. See, Uthman knows he's stupid and he knows he's a liar and deceiver like his prophet who's burning in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. So he can't do moderated debates. Whereas I've shown I can and do it successfully. Glory to the Holy Spirit. May he get the glory, not me. I've shown you I can. Right? He can. All he can do is these conversations where he talks, talks down to you because he's a wicked slob, a liar who can't defend his doctrines, because he knows he'll get pulverized and Muhammad will be exposed for being the son of the devil that he is. But keep pay attention now. I didn't change the order. I was talking about Muslims. Okay, okay. Jews use the lunar calendar and Muslims as well use it. Are you happy now? Good. Okay. Some Muslim countries, some Muslim countries use that crescent as a symbol because the lunar calendar was what they used in comparison to the Christians who use the solar calendar. There is no moon on the flag of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or his companions. Their flags, white, black, whatever, they had no moon on them. It's not an Islamic symbol. Many people use it. Indonesia doesn't have a moon on their flag. Yes. Anyway. But all right. So that's it. So what was his point? To sum up his point, there is no Quranic verse or hadith that says Allah has three daughter, daughters. Alat al uzabanat The Quran condemns that Allah has daughters and condemns that he has sons. Because nam yalad wa lam yulad. He neither begets nor is begotten. And the claim that there were verses acknowledging the daughters of Allah, what we call the satanic verses, those are false hadiths, right? That's his claim. So you heard it from the cow's mouth. Well, do me a favor. 
If you go to the description box, and Lord Jesus willing, when the session is done, I'll pin it as a comment. I provided several articles and rebuttals quoting reputable Muslim authorities acknowledging that the episode of the satanic verses is based on solid, quote-unquote, historical fact, meaning historical fact from the Muslim perspective, meaning if you apply the Islamic criteria for historicity, the satanic verses is an event that surely occurred, an event that took place in Muhammad's lifetime. It's an actual event where Muhammad compromised his monotheistic convic convictions. Now, notice what I said. If you apply Islamic criteria for historicity, the method that Muslims use to de demonstrate and determine whether a report of Muhammad is valid, whether Muhammad actually said something or did something, then the satanic verses passes with flying colors. So are you ready now to be educated? Everything I'm going to tell you is in the articles, rebuttals that I link to. You have my authorization. Please, just two conditions. Seek the face of the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to be disciplined enough to understand perfectly, perfectly what you are hearing, seeing, and reading. Because I've caught people misrepresent what they've heard me say or what they've read me right, and I've had to correct them, and I've actually rebuked them. You are not doing yourself a favor if you don't get the points down and understand them correctly, because then you're going to misinform people, confuse people, mislead people, even though that's not your intention. And when you mishear something and miscommunicate, someone else who knows the fact will then capitalize on your error and expose you because you were not careful enough to hear what the argument was, and therefore you passed on misinformation, which will end up discrediting you as being a reliable source of information. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand the facts perfectly. Once you do, use them for the glory of Jesus. And the second condition, whatever you take from me, do not charge. You can take my articles, make clips out of my sessions, upload them, translate them. Do not char charge. Freely you receive, freely you give. For the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? So are we ready now to go into the satanic verses? And why this is something that certainly took place in the life of Muhammad as far as Islamic criteria for historicity is concerned. If you believe Muhammad is mythical, then that's one thing. Are you ready? Are you guys ready? If you're ready... Let me explain something called Sahi Mursul. Sahi Mursul. What is that? Sahi Mursul means this is a chain in which all the narrators are deemed to be reliable men with sound memories, trustworthy men, men of integrity, but it's a chain that's classified as Mursul. Sahi Mursul chain. Okay, what's a Mursul? A Mursul here in this aspect means that there is a gap between one narrator and Muhammad. Meaning, a Mursul chain means that you have a report attributed to Muhammad where there's a gap between Muhammad and the next person in the chain. Guys, pay attention here. Trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me to speak correctly without error for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because I want to accurately represent this demonic religion. Okay? You with me there? Okay, listen. You have Muhammad, but there's a gap from Muhammad and the next in the chain. The next person in the chain. So, this is called a mursal chain. To give you an example... Imagine you have John the Apostle and Irenaeus. Well, Irenaeus wasn't an eyewitness to John. Better yet, let me give you a better one. Our Lord Jesus Christ and Polycarp. Okay, let me give you a better one. This is even better. Instead of using an apostle, we'll use Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have Jesus Christ our Lord, who is on earth, 
And then you have Polycarp, who wasn't a disciple of Jesus or an eyewitness to Jesus, telling you Jesus said X, Y, and Z. Well, there's a gap between Jesus and Polycarp because Polycarp did not meet Jesus, did not hear from Jesus directly. That means he must have gotten it from someone who was a follower of the Lord Jesus, but he doesn't tell us who that someone is. So this would be called a mursal chain. There's a gap, right? There's a gap. Well, Polycarp wasn't an eyewitness to Jesus, didn't walk with Jesus, didn't hear from Jesus directly. So when he says, Jesus said this, well, he must have gotten it from an eyewitness to Jesus who did walk with Jesus, who taught Polycarp. But Polycarp doesn't tell us who that disciple was who heard directly from Jesus and passed it on to Polycarp. That's called a mursal chain. You get my point? But because we know Polycarp is a reliable man, a man of integrity, a holy servant who would not lie because he loved Jesus Christ our Lord too much and proved it by dying as a martyr, even though he doesn't tell us who that disciple of Jesus was that he heard from, because of his integrity, we take him at his word, Jesus said that. Okay, you understand that? You understand what a morsel is? There's a gap between, let's say, Muhammad and the next person in the chain who's narrating from Muhammad. That's a morsel. So in Islam, you have the Sahaba. Sahaba are the companions of Muhammad. Then you have their disciples called the Tabi'in. The Tabi'in. So you have Muhammad, the Sahaba's companions, the Tabi'in, their followers, and the Tabi'in. Tabi the Tabi'in. Tabi so Muhammad's companions, their followers, and the followers of the followers of the, the companions. A mursal chain is where you have a Sahaba, a Sahabi, singular, right? Who hears from Muhammad, passes it on to his follower or followers, the Tabi'in, and they pass it on to their followers, the Tabi'in. Tabi but in a mursal chain, you have a tabi narrating from Muhammad, but he doesn't tell us the sahabi that he heard it from. So a sahabi is an eyewitness of Muhammad. A tabi would be his follower. In a mursal chain, you have the tabi mentioned, listed, but he doesn't tell us who the sahabi is, the companion of Muhammad, that he heard this report of Muhammad. You understand what? You, you get it now? Do you, you understand what's at stake? Because we're going to now read some what's called Sahi Mursul chains. And these chains, you have Muhammad reciting the satanic verses. But the next person in the chain telling us that he did is not a companion of Muhammad, a Sahabi, but a Tabi. A Tabi is a follower of the companions or companion of Muhammad. So there is a gap. There's a link missing from the Tabi, a follower of the companions of Muhammad or a companion of Muhammad, right, to Muhammad. So that Tabi, that follower of Muhammad's companion companions, doesn't tell us the Sahabi, the companion or Sahaba companions that he heard this report from. But because that tabi, the tabi, is reliable, deemed to be a man of integrity, a man who's trustworthy, whose memory is sound and indisputable, the chain is accepted. That's a sahi mursal chain. In other words, because he's reliable enough, we know he must have heard it from a reliable companion of Muhammad, though he doesn't give us the name, we trust him that he's a man of integrity, and therefore he must have received it from a companion Muhammad, and therefore this report is authentically <clears throat> attributed to Muhammad. It authentically goes back to Muhammad. You understand? Because I can't move on if you don't understand the points. You get it? So the satanic verses come down to us from sahi morsel reports meaning every narrator in the chain 
of transmission. Every transmitter is reliable, a man of integrity, trustworthy, with outstanding memory. And therefore, though the chain goes to a tabi, not a companion Muhammad, that tabi is reliable enough that we take his word that what he's saying Muhammad did must have been passed on to him by a companion. Sahih Mursal. Okay, you got it? Everyone got it before I move on to the evidence? So I repeat myself at least four times so we can get it. Okay, if we got it, now we can go into the chains. Let's go into this article. Here it is. It's in the description box. I'm going to be looking at this article for now. There's several we're going to look at, but give me a moment. Why do I need a moment? Because John is calling me. It's okay, GK. There are mods who can respond faster than you, and I'll take their word for it. So you want to make sure you got it. I know I speak fast. That's why I repeat myself three to four times. This is a class session. I don't want to rush through this because I want you to learn. Hey there, Delilah. Oh, it's how you cook the meat. Oh, it's how you smell my feet. I can't do the whole pitch, man. Oh, it's how you cook the meat. Oh, hey there, Delilah. That's the problem with live streams, guys. Nature calls and the John needs attention. Be my, be my. It's now or never. Okay, let's begin. Here you go from that article. Okay, let me find it. Here you go. This one, let me find. There's a lot of hadiths that I'm narrating and I'm trying to find the most relevant ones. Okay. Here it is. Here's one. Okay, let's let's begin. Pay attention because I'm going to give you the chain of narrators. All right. The messenger of God recited, "Have you considered Alat al Uzamanat, the third, the other?" And Satan cast unto his tongue, "Those are the high flying cranes. Their intercession is to be hoped for." So he praised them. And the mushrikun were greatly pleased by this and said, "He has mentioned our gods." So Gabriel came to him and said, recite to me what I brought you. And he recited, have you considered that al-Uzzamanat, the third, the other? Those are the high-flying cranes, their intercession is hoped for. He, Gabriel said, I did not bring you. This is from Satan. Satan, I'm thinking Arabic. Shaitan. This is from Satan. Or he said, this is from Satan. I did not bring you this, these. I did not bring you the verses. So God sent down. Chapter 22, verse 52 of the Quran. We have not sent before you a messenger or a prophet, but that when he, Tamana, Tamana, Satan cast something into his Umniya to the end of the verse. Now watch the chain. This narration is quoted from the tafsir of Ibn Mardawa. 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 However you want to pronounce it. In a later hadith collection, namely the Mukhtara. Mukhtar of al Diya al Maqdisi with the chain going back to Ibn Abbas. Okay, Ibn Abbas. Now I'm going to give you the names because uh, so, so when Fat Slob, Stone Pig Licking Pagan, Sheikh Uthman hears it, he won't have any way of refuting these chains. Ahmad, Ahmad bin Musa bin, Ar bin Mardawa. Al Isbahani, his father, Musa bin Mardawah, Al Isbahani, Ibrahim bin Muhammad bin Matawah. These names. Al Isbahani, we got it, buddy. A lot of Isbahanis here. Muhammad bin Ali Al Mukri Al Baghdadi, Jafar bin Muhammad Al 
تياليسي البغدادي ابراهيم بن محمد بن ارارا البصري البغدادي ابو عاصم النبيل الدهق بن مخلد المكي البصري عثمان الاسود سيد بن جبير ابن عباس so at least this comes from ibn abbas now this is from a sahabi a companion muhammad okay and then it says dia al din abu abdullah muhammad bin abdul wahid bin abdul rahman al hanbali al maqdisi al hadith al mukhtara al al mustakhraj min al al hadith my al mukhtara min ma لم يخرج يخرج البخاري ومسلم في صحيح هما Ooh, say that five times fast now al Suyuti also cites this hadith directly from B B Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit loosen my tongue save me from stammering and stuttering rebuke satanic attacks in the name of the Lord Jesus Amen talk about lisp there are certain words that kill me and reading these arabic names don't help so al sayuti quotes it directly from ibn mardawa claiming that its chain is made up of listen reliable transmitters sanad rijaluhu thiqat thiqat they're reliable so this chain is reliable slop now jafar bin muhammad al Tayalisi, Tayalisi, Baghdadi, Ibrahim bin Muhammad bin Arara, Al Basri, Al Baghdadi, Abu Asim, Al Nabil, Al Dahak bin Makhlad, Al Makki, Al Basri, and Uthman bin Al Aswad, Al Makki, are considered, these are the people in the chain, to be impeachable transmitters and to have been Hadith scholars, Muhaddithun. Okay, now watch. Uthman bin al-Aswad was also known for studying under two prominent mufassirun, meaning commentators, Mujahid bin Jabir and Atiyah bin Sa'ad al-Awfi. Did you catch it, guys? These are reliable men, impeachable men. So you can't say, oh, it's weak. It's, it's, it's a forged, okay? Even Ibn Hajar al-Askalani. Why is he important? Ibn Hajar al-Askalani. Sorry, guys, it's buffering, Okay. Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, he is the one who wrote a commentary on al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari. Okay? Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, what did he say about this particular transmission? This is what he says. He considered this particular transmission I just read for you to be the most reliable of all the chains narrating the satanic verses. Takhrij, Hadith al Kashab. So he says this is the most reliable, and he accepted it. Okay, Ibn Hajar al Askalani. Now other sources include, watch this, Al Bazar and Al Tabarani and Ibn Mardawa and Al Zia narrated through a chain of all trustworthy. The word is thikka. Narrated by the way of Sayyid Ibn Jubair from Ibn Abbas again. That prophet recited the words of Surah Al-Najm in the following manner. Have you then considered the last, the Uzzamanat, the third, the last? These are the lofty idols. Verily, their intercession is sought after. Now watch. Mushrikeen became delighted on hearing this from the Holy Prophet. And this is not my translation, by the way. Okay, he's neither holy nor a prophet. And said that their idols have also been mentioned in the Quran. Then Jibreel came and said to the prophet, recite same revelation and Quran which I have brought. The prophet again recited the words, have you then considered the lat, the uzza, manat, the third, the last? These are the lofty idols. Verily their intercession is sought after. Jibreel said, I had not brought these words. These are from Satan. Then the following verse was revealed. Chapter 22, verse 52. Now watch again what al Suyuti says. A renowned Muslim scholar, okay? Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, okay? Guys, watch as I read. Record similar versions of this incident from several other Sahih chains. Sahih, 
For example, quote, look what he says. Ibn Jarir and Ibn Al-Mundir and Ibn Abi Hatim and Ibn Mardawa have narrated through a Sahih chain. Sahih chain, Fibin. By the way of Sayyid Ibn Jubair who said, Ibn Jarir, Ibn Al-Munzir and Ibn Abi Hati, Hatim narrated with a Sahih chain from Abi Al-Aliyah. Now watch this one. Abd, Abd bin Abd bin Hamid and Ibn Jarir, by the way of Yunus, from Ibn Shahab narrated with a Mursal Sahih chain. So you mentioned three chains that are Sahih authentic, narrating the satanic verses. Okay, you guys got it? You guys got it? Pay attention. Invite more folks. Let's make the channel go for the glory of Jesus Christ. Who doesn't need me? We need him. Now, despite the fact that this Qadi named Thanaullah, Thanaullah, Pani, Pati, Uthmani, he rejected the satanic verses. He didn't accept it. Despite him rejecting it, Qadi, Pani, Pati, Uthmani, Yet still in his commentary on 22 verse 52, notice what he admits. Look what he says. He doesn't accept it. It's in a Mazari. It's in Urdu. Tafsir Mazari, volume 8, page 94. Doesn't accept it, but has to admit this. Watch. However, the tradition we previously, previously mentioned from Sayyid, Sayyid bin Jubair by Bazar, Ibn Mardawi and Tabarani is indeed successive mutawatir, multiple mutawatir and strong. Qawwi, he admits, it's multiply attested and it's strong, even though he doesn't want to accept it. Ibn Hajar al-Askalani has stated that from the abundance of traditions reported, there's so many that reported, it is deemed that there is some truth in it. Ouch! Woo! Ouch! Guys, don't mind the buffering. This is the best we can do. In Jesus' name, may the connection stay strong and the sound stay strong. Rebuke Satan in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Holy Spirit. You got it? Before I move on? Everyone got it? Focus, guys. Okay, before let's just hold on. Let's just wait the buffering. Sound good? Okay. Now here's the exact words of Ibn Hajar al Askalani. I give the Arabic and the translation. Fath al Bari, Shar Sahih al Bukhari. His commentary on Sahih al Bukhari. Fath al Bari, Shar Sahih al Bukhari, Volume Eight, Page Four Thirty Nine. However, various versions mean that the story has an origin. Meaning you can't just say it's fabrication because there's so many of them. Although there are two authentic versions. Wait, wait, wait. What did you say? For those of you who are Arabic, what did Ibn Hadir al-Askalani say? The commentator of al-Bukhari. Okay, Arabic readers, read this for me. There you go. That's the Arabic. Do you see the Arabic? Sorry, guys, it's buffering. Please, Lord Jesus, bless the connection. Ya Allah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You see it? Arabic readers, read the Arabic. Here it is again. Now, let me get you a rough English translation. However, the tradition, I'm sorry, wrong one. However, various versions mean that the story has an origin, although there are two authentic versions. So he admits there are two versions that he considers authentic, sahih. Okay. Arabic readers, did you confirm the translation of the Arabic? Before I move on, I got more. And then we're going to segue into Shabir Ali. It's all in those articles and rebuttals that I linked to. Chloe reads Arabic. I don't know why she's not commenting. Marina Adam. All right. Now, let's continue. Okay, let's continue. We got more. All right. Ibn Abi Bakr al-Haythami 
Ibn Abi Bakr al-Haythami, he's another Sunni scholar who affirmed that the episode concerning the satanic verses is sahih. This comes from Majma al-Zawadi, Majma al-Zawadi, volume 7, page 248, number 11376. And I'm going to give you the Arabic. Look what he says. Al-Bazar and Tabarani narrated it, and they added, the penalty of a mighty day and the day of Badr, the narrators are the narrators of Sahih. These narrators are those that narrated, na narrate Sahih, sound narrations. Doesn't this fat slob know these narrations? Here it is. Here's the Arabic. Here's the Arabic. Chloe, wait. Walk it. Okay. Now, let me shock you even more than you've already been shocked. You guys ready? You know who believed the satanic verses? actually took place did you know who defended the satanic verses and claimed that muhammad did utter verses praising the pagan goddesses and was rebuked and he repented do you guys know who you know who can anyone take a guess i'm waiting for you guys to take a guess so it can sink in. Anybody know who? Ibn Taymiyyah. Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, the one Muslim scholar that Salafis love and adore. Ibn Taymiyyah. And this slob, Fibin, is a Salafi scholar. Not a scholar. He's not a scholar. He's a joke. No, he's not a scholar. He's a Salafi. Ibn Taymiyyah. Let me read what he says. Here you go. This comes from Ibn Taymiyyah. Minhaj Sunnah, volume 2, page 409. Minhaj Sunnah, volume 2, page 409. Oh boy, it's going to get worse. Quote, what occurred with Surat al-Najm, that's chapter 53, where the satanic verses originally appeared, and its recitation, these are the lofty idols, verily their intercession sought after, is well known amongst the Salaf, meaning the first three generations of Muslims. This story is well known, that this was recited by the Messenger of Allah, and then Allah abrogated it. Ooh! Ibn Taymiyyah buries this lying slob and says, is well known amongst the Salaf, the first three generations of Muslims, that this was recited by the Messenger of Allah, and then Allah abrogated it. So much so that a modern Muslima named Ingrid, Ingrid Matson admits that Ibn Taymiyyah accepted the veracity of the satanic verses. In the book, The Story of the Quran, its history and place in Muslim life, pages 54 to 55, she says this. Ingrid Matson. The story of the Quran, its history and place in Muslim life, pages 54 and 55. Are you ready? Let me read what she says about the satanic verses. Given this background and given the consistent assertion throughout the Quran is that God alone should be worshipped. Many scholars have rejected the validity of the report about the so-called satanic verses. This report claims... That due to the distress the prophet felt because of the severe persecution of his followers, he was susceptible. He was susceptible to the suggestion suggestion of Satan to inter interject to include interject a verse into Surah An Najm, the chapter fifty three, suggesting that the celestial goddesses Alat Al Uzza and Manat are high flying cranes whose intercession is approved. This validation of the beliefs of the Meccans was said to have pleased them so that they stopped their persecution of the Muslims. However, Gabriel appeared to the prophet and made him aware of his mistake and revealed the verse, and she quotes 2252. Now watch what she says. Watch what she says. Okay, guys, listen. 
For the majority of Muslim scholars, this report does not meet the standard established by hadith criticism. Lie. We just showed it did. Because it lacks a valid isnat. Lie. And its content contradicts the belief of the majority of the Muslims. Their prophets are infallible. Now watch here though. A minority of scholars, however, most notably, most notably, the Syrian Hanbali scholar Ibn Taymiyyah accepted the validity of these reports. Who? Ingrid Matson? Ibn Taymiyyah accepted it. Here you go. It's all in my articles and rebuttals. Accurate citations. We don't lie. We don't deceive like Uthman and his prophet and his prophet's father, the devil. May the Lord Jesus save us from Muhammad. And she concludes, Ibn Taymiyyah agreed with the majority that all prophets are infallible. However, he understood this infallibility not as preventing prophets from ever committing errors, but as preventing them from persisting in them once committed. The commission of such errors is part of God's to allow them an opportunity to repent and perfect their character. She's not the only one, folks. Another renowned, reputable Muslim scholar who's a convert, Jonathan Brown. And I give you the link to my article where I quote him. Jonathan Brown, who's a professor at Georgetown University, considered one of the most knowledgeable Western scholars of Islam, a convert to Islam. He admits that Ibn Taymiyyah confirmed the satanic verses. Here it is from my article. I'm going to give you the name of the book. But so far, you guys, are you guys listening or are you asleep? You with me so far? Before I move on? Okay. There's the article again. Here's the link to my article. And I'm gonna I'm quoting from his very short booklet. Let me give you the name of it. Okay. All right. Let me just get it for you. Let me get the name. All right, this comes from his book. Let me get the name. Muhammad, a very short introduction. Muhammad, a very short introduction by Oxford University Press, published 2011. Muhammad, a very short introduction. Okay, guys? Now let's see what he says about Ibn Taymiyyah and the Satanic Verses. Here you go. And I'm quoting from Pages 97 to 99. 97 to 99. You guys listening? Let's begin. Jonathan Brown admits about the satanic verses. According to the story, soon afterwards, Gabriel informed Muhammad that the last verse had not been revealed by God. Now, these are his words. Rather, Satan had fooled the prophet into thinking it was divine revelation. Satan fooled Muhammad, folks. Jonathan Brown, considered one of the most reputable scholars of Islam in the West, a convert to Islam, Professor Georgetown University, admits Satan fooled his prophet. Here it is, his words. Rather, Satan had fooled the prophet into thinking it was divine revelation. Okay? I don't know why Edward De La Rosa is going to get blocked for talking about irrelevant issues. He's been harping on Allah of Islam not being the God of the Bible for the past 10 minutes. Edward, you know I'm going to pack, send you packing, right? I'm going to now send you packing. Because if anyone should know, it should be you. Why are you harping on Allah of the Quran not being the same God of Jews and Christians? For the past 10 minutes and not focusing on the topic. In fact, here, Edward, I'm going to challenge you. What am I talking about right now? Hold on, let me see. What's my topic? Who am I citing right now? The, give me the name of the author I'm quoting right now. Edward, real quickly. So I can send you packing. To prove that you're here just to troll and distract. Who am I quoting right now, Edward? Who's the scholar that I'm quoting in re respect to Ibn Taymiyyah and the Satanic Verses. Come on, Edward. 
We're going to wait for you to respond. Sorry, guys. People who've been here long enough who know the rules still don't give a damn about the rules because it's all about them and their agenda. So hold on, guys. We're going to give it because there's a 60-second delay. He's going to have to answer the question because he's going to get blocked. Who am I quoting right now, Edward? Who is the author that I'm quoting in relation to Ibn Taymiyyah and the Satanic Verses? If you don't answer within 20 seconds, I'm blocking you. See, there you go. Thank you. Get the hell out of here. Don't you ever come back to my channel. Don't you ever come back to my channel. You arrogant jerk. Coming in here, pretending you're listening to learn. Get him out of here, guys. You see? He wasn't listening. Get him out of here. Quick. Come on, mods. Let's see if you're listening. There you go. Okay? See? It's all about his agenda. Doesn't want to listen. All right. You guys ready? How many more am I going to get rid of? Because although I want a lot of people to come and learn, I don't want people who are here not paying attention because they think they know it all. Why are you here? Get the hell out of here. Go somewhere else. This is a class session. This is not for you to come and just talk about what you want. Sorry, guys. See? This is how I know he wasn't paying attention. Rushdie, you jerk. For the past 20 minutes, you've been barking about Allah not being the God of the Bible and not paying attention to the topic. Don't come back here. Now, for the rest of you, pretending to be paying attention. GK, your wish is my command. Thank you. There you go, GK. Your wish is my command. Everyone else, are you seriously listening or are you wasting my time and I'm wasting yours? Should I proceed? Because this is important issues, topics. We got to be serious. Not time to be lazy or nonchalant. All right, let's continue. According to the story, soon afterwards, Gabriel informed Muhammad that the last verse had not been revealed by God. Rather, Satan had fooled the prophet into thinking it was divine revelation. The verse was removed from the Quran and replaced by the verse that follows, verse 5320. In the Quran, we know today, this is how it reads. These supposed goddesses are nothing but empty names you have invented, you and your fathers, for which God has bestowed no warrant from on high. Chapter 53, 21 to 23. God then comforted Muhammad by revealing that we never sent a messenger or prophet before you without Satan intervening in his desires, but God abrogates what Satan interposes. Now watch what he says, folks. Pay attention. Watch what he says. The story of the satanic verses appears in the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq, as well as most early works of Quranic commentary. He's admitting the earlier works of Quranic commentary include this story. Western historians have accepted it as true based on the historical critical method principle that reports that seem to contradict orthodoxy must be true. Who would make them up? As Watt notes, the satanic verses story is so strange that it must be true in its essentials. Now watch this. Look who he's going to mention. Indeed, the story seems to undermine the central pillars of Muhammad's claim to prophecy, his status as an infallible channel revelation, and the complete reliability of the Quran. From a Muslim point of view, if Satan could interfere in the revelation of the Holy Book, how do we know that other verses were not also tampered with? Exactly. From a Muslim point of view, if Satan could intervene, intervene, interfere, if Satan could interfere in the revelation of the Holy Book, how do we know that other verses were not also tampered with? From the point of view of a non-Muslim evaluating Muhammad's claims to prophethood, his error in the revelation makes him seem like a mere mortal who first politic, politic, politic. Politikik, this word, politikik, to earn Meccan support and then try to cover up a mistake. Now watch here. We must be careful, however, in relying too heavily on the principles of the historical critical method. Just because we think that a story makes an orthodox tradition look bad does not mean that the participants 
in that tradition, viewed it in the same way. The great historian of the Prophet's campaigns, Al-Waqadi, reports that when Muhammad sent Khalid bin Walid to destroy the island of Uzza, now watch Muhammad's racism. Khalid was sent by Muhammad to destroy the idol, right, of Al-Uzza. Now watch, when he sent him, it came alive, the goddess Al-Uzza came alive in the form of a naked black woman. Did you catch it? According to Muslim sources, Al-Uzza is a real being because she appeared as a black woman and Khalid killed her dead. Came alive in the form of a naked black woman with long, wild hair. This also seems to contradict the orthodox vision of Islam. The Quran repeatedly states that idols cannot speak or defend themselves. See, for example, Quran 21, 58, 67. Did you catch Muhammad's racism? Everything evil, wicked, satanic is black. Al Uzza, this goddess, appeared as a black woman, and Khalid killed her dead. Muhammad has a dream of a black woman and says that was a sign that an epidemic would break out. Muhammad then tells that at the latter days, a black man with skinny legs will destroy the Kaaba. Right? And he says, if you have a leader who's also or happens to be an Ethiopian, a black Ethiopian with the head of a raisin, you should still follow him nonetheless. And tradition attributed to Muhammad says that when Adam was created, Allah stroked the left shoulder, the left side of Adam, and black offspring, black descendants that looked like small black ants came out. And he says, these are for hell. These I create for hell, and they happen to be black. But now the part with Ibn Taymiyyah. Okay? Here it is. Last paragraph. We must consider the possibility that early Muslims saw the story of the satanic verses as well as those of live idols as totally consistent with their religion. Certainly, most Muslim scholars later rejected the story of the satanic verses. Notice, most Muslim scholars later the early commentators and the earliest extent biography on Muhammad's life confirmed the story. Later Muslims, right, rejected the story of the satanic verses as heresy. The Spanish Muslim scholar Qadiyad argued that the story could not have been true because none of the critics of Muhammad from the Quraysh ever took advantage of the episode to undermine his claims of prophecy. Now watch Jonathan Brown, like Ingrid Matson, confirm that Ibn Taymiyyah believed it was historical. Some, like Ibn Taymiyyah, who died 1328, explained them by saying that the prophet was still entirely trustworthy as a medium of revelation because God would have corrected him whenever the devil confused him. In the late antique world in which God constantly intervened in the lives of his prophets, the satanic verses would not seem out of place. Did you guys catch it? Jonathan Brown and Ingrid Matson confirmed Ibn Taymiyyah, whom Salafi Muslims love, confirmed this event happened. And Allah immediately corrected him and he repented. And Jonathan Brown admits that the earliest source, the earliest extent biography in Muhammad's life, Ibn Ishaq, mentioned this event. And the earlier Quranic commentators all mentioned this event. And I just mentioned to you several chains deemed to be Sahih Mursul and several chains going back to Ibn Abbas where the people in the chain are considered to be strong, reliable, awi, thiqat, and multiply attested. And even Ibn Hajar al Askalani, the commentator on Bukhari admits there are so many reports that it must be based in actual historical fact and there are two chains that are sahih. You guys caught it? So far with me? Because I have something else to share with you. Okay, this comes from this other article. Okay. Here's this other article. Here you go. 
Focus, guys. Here's the other article, all of it in the description box. Let me now read a few more of the chains because I want you to see something. Okay. Let me again read one of the chains that are deemed authentic. And then I'm going to read something Muhammad said that shows you that according to the Quran, Muhammad must be burning in hell if the Quran is true. But it's not. And he is burning in hell, but for other reasons. This comes from Suyuti's Tafsir Dur al Manthur. Okay, pay attention. Al Bazar and Al Tabrani and Ibn Mardawi and Al Zia. This is a chain I already mentioned, but I'm going to read it again. Have narrated through a chain of all trustworthy thiqqa narratives. They're all trustworthy. By the way, of Sayyid Ibn Jubair from Ibn Abbas, Muhammad's first cousin, that the Prophet recited the words of Surah Al Najm, chapter 53. In the following manner, have you cons then considered the lat, the uzamanat, the third, the last? These are the lofty idols. Verily, their intercession is sought after. The idolaters became delighted on hearing this from the prophet and said that their idols have also been mentioned in the Quran. Then Gabriel came and said to the prophet, recite same revelation and Quran which I brought. Prophet again recited the words. Have you then considered the lat, the uzamanat, the third, the last? These are the lofty idols, verily their intercession is sought after. Gabriel said, I had not brought these words. These are from Satan. Got it? These are from Satan. Okay. Now, I want to read something for you guys. Watch this. This is where you can use the Quran to show that if the Quran is true, Muhammad is burning in hell. Burning in hell, okay? Let me read this one. This report I'm going to read to you, okay? Let me first look at it because I want to make sure. Okay. This report comes from Muhammad Mustafa Al-Azami, Maghazi Rasulullah Li Urwa Ibn Al-Zubair Bi Rewayat Abi al Aswad Anhu al Nuscha al Mustrakhraja Mustrakhad. God, I hate when they're words. Mustrakhraja Mustrakhraja Mustrakhaja Mustrakhaja Maktab al Tarbiya al Arabi li Dual al Khalij. Pages 160, 161. Sorry, man, uh, guys. I have a lisp. It kills me. It also is found in Abu Al-Qasim, Suleiman bin Ahmad Al-Tabarani that narrated with the following chain, Muhammad bin Amr bin Khalid bin uh, Khalid Al-Harani Al-Misri, Amr, Amr bin Khalid Al-Harani Al-Misri, Abdullah ibn Lahiya Al-Misri, Muhammad bin Abdul Rahman Abu Al-Aswad Al-Madani Al-Misri, Urwa bin Al Zubair Al Madani, Urwa bin Al Zubair, and it comes from Al Mujam Al Kabir, Al Mujam Al Kabir, edited by Hamdi Abdul Majid Al Salafi, right? Volume 9, pages 34 36, also found, right? Abu Bakr Muhammad bin Ali Al Mutawi, Al Ghazi Al Naysaburi Al Makki, who gives this chain. Abu al-Abbas, Ahmad bin al-Hassan, bin Bundar al-Razi al-Makki, Abu al-Qasim, Suleiman bin Ahmad al-Tabarani, Muhammad bin Amr bin Khalid al-Harani al-Misri, Ab Amr bin Khalid al-Harani al-Misri, Urwa ibn al-Zubayr. And it's from Kitab man Sabara, Sabara Zafira, pages 77b to 78b. These are the chains that narrate this version, get ready to see how Muhammad, according to the Quran, is burning in hell. You guys ready? Burning in hell. There you go. Listen to this version and be shocked. If you guys learn these facts, understand these facts, and ask Holy Spirit to perfect your ability to understand and recall these facts perfectly, you will annihilate Islam over and over again, showing Muhammad is of the devil, even according to the Quran, 
He's burning in hell according to the Quran. Though the Quran is false, and he's still burning in hell for other reasons, for denying the true word of God, the Bible, and the Lord Jesus Christ, his God and destroyer. Watch the version that these narrators reported. Listen. Then those who had gone to Abyssinia the first time returned before the departure of Jafar bin Abi Talib and his companions. This is when God sent down the surah in which he states, by the star when it sets. That's chapter 53. The Mushrikun had said, if only this man would speak favorably of our gods, we would secure him and his companions. He does not speak of any, the Jews and Christians who oppose his religion with the abuse and invective, which he speaks of our gods. He abuses us worse than he does the Jews and Christians. Now watch. When God sent down the sermon, which he mentions by the star, he recited, Qara'a, have you considered Alat, al Uzamanat, the third, the other? At this point, Satan cast into Surat al a mention of the evil ones. And he, Muhammad said, indeed they are high-flying cranes, and indeed their intercession is to be hoped for. Right? That was the rhyming prose of Satan and was an instance of his sedition. Right? Now watch here. Those two phrases became lodged in the heart of every mushrik. Their tongues were debased by them. They rejoiced at them and said, Muhammad has returned to his original religion and the religion of his tribe. Muhammad has returned to his original religion and the religion of his tribe. Please remember this. Muhammad's companions who knew him, the pagans who grew up with him said, he came back to his original religion and the religion of his tribe. Remember that. Please keep that in mind. As for the Mushrikun, their minds were set at ease in regard to the Prophet and his companions when they heard what Satan cast into the Umniya of the Prophet. Satan told them that the Messenger of God had recited them, right? When it's Sajda, so they made the Sajda in veneration of their gods. Now watch this part. This part. The Messenger of God was greatly distressed by this. In the evening, Gabriel came to him. He, the Prophet, complained to him. So he, Gabriel, ordered him to recite the surah, and he recited to him. When he, Muhammad, reached them, prophet reached them, satanic verses, or when Gabriel heard the satanic verses, Gabriel absolved himself of responsibility for them and said, God, protect me from these. My Lord did not send them down, nor your Lord command me with them. When the messenger of God saw this, guys, pay attention to his words. He was greatly disturbed and said, I have obeyed Satan. Muhammad's own mouth, the donkey's own mouth, the horse's own mouth. I have obeyed sp Satan and have, become, and have spoken. I have obeyed Satan and spoken his words. And he has become a partner in God's matter with me. And the word partner is sharika. I have spoken Satan's words. I have obeyed Satan. And Satan has now become a partner with Allah in what I said. I have made Satan a partner with Allah, obeyed Satan and spoken his words. And the word for partner, sharika. Muhammad acknowledged he committed shirk. Shirk. He committed shirk. And according to chapter 4, verse 48 of the Quran, chapter 4, verse 116 of the Quran, chapter 39, verse 65, chapter 2, verse 22, when you commit shirk, this is the sin of associating a partner with Allah, ascribing a partner with Allah. When you commit that after knowing the religion, you have now committed this sin. Allah will not forgive you and damn you to hell for. You guys got it? Before I move on, you see why you got to learn these facts, these sources, learn about the satanic verses. Because according to the Quran's own criterion, Muhammad is damned to hell. He's burning in hell. 
because he failed his own Quran. Let it sink in before I move on. You caught it? Okay, did it sink in? Because I want to revisit this part. When Muhammad praised the God, it says, notice what the pagan said who grew up with him. Those two phrases became lodged in the heart of every mushrik. Their tongues were defaced by them. They rejoiced at them and said, Muhammad has returned to his original religion, meaning Muhammad's original religion, religion of Muhammad, what he originally observed was idolatry. So he returned to his original religion, the religion of his tribe. Now, let me quote to you what Jonathan Brown admits. Jonathan Brown admits that the Muslim sources teach that Muhammad was a pagan who worshipped the I idols, the gods and goddesses, and sacrificed to them. This comes from his book, pages 92 to 93. Watch. Here you go. Watch. One of the greatest challenges that Muslims encountered in their confrontation with Christians was the question of Muhammad's sinlessness. If Muhammad was truly God's last prophet, whose religion had come to abrogate Christianity, should he not be the equal of Jesus and his mother Mary? In other words, sinless? Because the Quran acknowledges Mary and Jesus are sinless. Okay? All right? Here, the story of the washing of Muhammad's heart is most pertinent. The angels removing the black spot from his heart and resealing his chest represents the removal of sin, leaving Muhammad as pure as the immaculately conceived Mary and Jesus. Now watch. A closely related issue was whether Muhammad had ever participated and the poly polytheist religion, polytheist religion of his people before his prophethood. See, that's what the Muslims debated. Did Muhammad originally participate in the idolatrous practices of his tribe? Muslims came up with the view no, in order to affirm his sinlessness. Now watch. Quoting Jonathan Brown, if Muhammad was as pure as Jesus was in the eyes of Christians, his infall infallibility and innocence could not have begun at the age of 40. When he was blessed with prophecy, they had to be part of his very constitution. By the ninth century, that's the year 800 onwards, nearly 20 years after the death of Muhammad, it had thus become part of Islamic orthodox that the prophet had never engaged in the rituals of pre Islamic paganism. When? Ninth century, about 20 years after Muhammad reportedly died. Even a senior Sunni scholar, Baghdad, Ibn Abi, Abi Shayba, who died 853, almost lost his credibility for suggesting that Muhammad even watched pagan celebrations. The report in the Sirah about Muhammad miraculously falling asleep instead of attending a rowdy wedding celebration seems designed to protect him from accusations of any prophetic free living. So Jonathan Brown is admitting they made up stories. Now watch his candid admission. Similarly, later Muslim scholars would insist that Muhammad had never eaten any meat sacrificed before an idol. Now watch. Ibn Ishaq Sirah, however, the oldest extent biography by Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq Sirah, however, included a report that as a youth, Muhammad once offered the meat of an animal slaughtered at a pagan altar to a Hanif in Mecca. So Muhammad took meat, slaughtered to an idol, and gave it to this man who had renounced idolatry. He became a Hanif. The Hanif, the Hanif, piously counseled Muhammad that eating meat sacrificed to idols is sacrilegious, and the young Muhammad decided never to do so again. Not surprisingly, Ibn Asham, the one who edited Ibn Ishaq and changed it, removed this story from his edition of the Sirah. Later Muslims, such as the great scholar of Damascus, Al-Dahabi, would insist that the prophet had never eaten meat slaughtered in a pagan manner. Any report recorded by earlier Muslims had simply been misunderstood. Muhammad may have slaughtered an animal in the proximity of an idol, but never to an idol. Did you catch what Jonathan Brown is admitting? That the earlier Muslims admitted Muhammad sacrificed two idols and ate meats offer titles, 
And it was a Hanif that corrected him. Later on, the Muslims who made Muhammad more than he was were uncomfortable with these stories. So either they expunged them or explained them away. Okay, with me there? Because I'm now going to read another so-called Muslim scholar. Riza Aslam. This is the best internet connection we can get in Florida. Florida sucks. Can you guys hear me? Okay, are you ready now? Riza, Riza Aslan. What does he admit? Okay. In his book, No God But God, The Origins of Evolution and Future of Islam, pages 15 to 17. Are you guys ready? You guys ready? Riza Aslan. You ready for me to read it? I may do Shabir Ali separately because it's already over two hours and I know Hussein Meshni is live. So I want us to go support the brother. So let me just finish it with this. Okay. Quoting Riza Aslan. Riza Aslan. Notice what he admits about Muhammad being an idolater who engaged in idolatrous practices. Quote. There exists a little-known tradition recounting an astonishing meeting between Zayed, the Hanif, the Hanif, and a teenage Muhammad. This is a story that Jonathan Brown was alluding to. The story seems to have been originally reported by Yunus ibn Buqayr on the authority of Muhammad's first biographer, Ibn Ashaq. And while it appears to have been expunged from Ibn Asham's retelling Muhammad's life, M.J. Kister has cataloged, look how many reports, no fewer than 11 other traditions, 12 in total, 11 other traditions that recount nearly identical versions of story. So we have about 12 versions of Muhammad eating sacrifice meat to idols and being corrected by Hanif, Zayed. Okay? It was the Chronicles say, one of the hot days of Mecca, when Muhammad and his childhood friend, Ibn Haritha, were returning home from Tayyif, where they had slaughtered, they slaughtered and roasted a ewe in sacrifice to one of the idols, most likely Allah. As the two boys made their way through the upper part of the Meccan Valley, they suddenly came upon Zayed, who was either living as a recluse on the high ground above Mecca or is in the midst of the wrecking. Greeting the Jahali, that's the pagans of Islam, in the Sabahan, and sat down next to him. Now, just pay attention. Muhammad asked, What are you, O son of Amr, hated by your people? I found them associating divinities with God, and I was reluctant to do the same. Zayd replied, I wanted the religion of Abraham. So Zayd renounced idolatry. Muhammad accepted this explanation without comment. And open his bag of sacrificed meat. Some of this food, Muhammad said. Now watch. But Zayd reacted with disgust. Nephew, that is a part of those sacrifices of yours which you offer to your idols, is it not? Muhammad answered that it was. Zayd became indignant. I never eat of these sacrifices and I want nothing to do with them, he cried. I am not one to eat anything slaughtered for a divinity other than God. So struck was Muhammad by Zayed's rebuke that many years later, when recounting the story, he claimed never again to have stroked an idol of theirs nor sacrificed to them until God honored me with his apostleship. So here you have at least 12 traditions, meaning Muhammad was a pagan who worshipped the idols, sacrificed the idols, and stroked the idols, and it took a person named Zayed, who had renounced idolatry before him to rebuke him to do likewise. We're not done yet. You ready? The notion that a young pagan Muhammad, the notion that a young pagan Muhammad could have been scolded for his idolatry by Hanif flies in the face of traditional Muslim views regarding the Prophet's perpetual monotheistic integrity. It is a common belief in Islam that even before his calling by God, Muhammad never took part in the pagan rituals of his community. 
In his history of the Prophet, Al-Tabri states that God kept Muhammad from ever participating in any pagan rituals, lest he be defiled by them. But this view, which is reminiscent of the Catholic belief in Mary's perpetual virginity, has little basis in either history or scripture. What did you say, Aslan? This view has little basis in either history or scripture. Not only does the Quran admit that God found Muhammad erring, and gave him guidance, chapter 93, verse 7. But the ancient traditions clearly show Muhammad deeply involved in the religious customs of Mecca, circumambulating the Kaaba, making sacrifices, and going on devotional retreats called Tahannuth. Ouch! Indeed, when the pagan sanctuary was torn down and rebuilt, it was enlarged and finally roofed, Muhammad took an active part in its reconstruction. Final paragraph. All the same, the doctrine of Muhammad's mon monotheistic integrity is an important facet of Muslim faith because it appears to support the belief that the revelation he received came from a divine source. Admitting that Muhammad might have been influenced by someone like Zayed is, for some Muslims, tantamount to denying the heavenly inspiration of Muhammad's message. But such beliefs are based on the common yet erroneous assumption that religions are born in some sort of cultural vacuum. They most certainly are not, end quote. There you go. You understand the problems now? Let me sum up the problems. The earliest, most reliable sources of Islam, reliable as far as Muslim histo historiography is concerned, Muslim criteria is concerned, Muhammad was a pagan. He worshipped the gods and goddesses of his pagan tribe. He stroked them and sacrificed to them. It wasn't until a Hanif, a man named Zayed, who had announced the idolatry of the pagans, who rebuked Muhammad for sacrificing to idols and eating their meat, that Muhammad stopped sacrificing to idols. Secondly, Muhammad, according to most authentic sources, deemed to be sahih, Later on, in Mecca, after claiming to be a prophet and condemning idolatry, lapsed into idolatry by praising the three daughters of Allah, Alat al uzzamanat and saying that these are high-flying cranes whose intercession are accepted by Allah, encouraging the pagans to pray and worship them. Then Gabriel supposedly came and told Muhammad, I did not reveal these to you, and Muhammad admitted I have obeyed Satan, and I've recited his words, and I've made Satan a partner with Allah by reciting his words, claiming to have committed shirk. So according to the Muslim sources, Muhammad knowingly committed shirk after condemning idolatry and claiming only Allah is worthy of worship, which means according to Quran, Muhammad committed the unpardonable sin. He's burning in hell. Because Allah will never forgive that sin. All according to the Muslim sources. How are you doing, my brother Francisco? Lord Jesus bless you. You caught it? This not only means Muhammad committed shirk, and according to the Quran, he's burning in hell, and he is, for other reasons, for denying the true Jesus and the true word of God, the Bible. But this means if Muhammad could be duped, in reciting verses from Satan that he thought were verses of Quran from Allah, then what guarantee do Muslims have that other verses were not from Satan as well? In fact, what guarantee do they have that the entire Quran is nothing but satanic deception, revelation, where Satan appeared as Gabriel, and recited verses of the Quran, then had him recite verses praising the goddesses, then reappeared as Gabriel to rebuke him for reciting those verses in order to deceive him that he was truly Gabriel, because after all, Satan would not rebuke him for praising the goddesses. He'd encourage him, which would be Satan's mastermind. You understand what I'm getting at? Wouldn't this be a master plan of Satan to appear as Gabriel and have him recite all these verses condemning the goddesses and the gods 
and calling them to worship this false god Allah, then out of nowhere, inspiring him to then praise the goddesses and then show up as Gabriel later on, rebuking him, saying, what did you do? I didn't give you those verses, which would only reinforce to Muhammad that the real Gabriel was appearing to him when in reality it was Satan from beginning to end. In order to earn his trust into thinking, all these other verses are from Gabriel, not from me, Satan. Because after all, when you did recite verses of Satan, I showed up to rebuke you saying, shame on you. Don't you dare praise the goddesses in order to deceive Muhammad and to thinking all the other verses are not from Satan, but from Gabriel. See the master plan? Brilliant, right? But this also introduces another problem. A further contradiction, folks. Chapter 17, verse 88 of the Quran. Let me get there. A further contradiction. 1788 with 1850. What other contradiction? Here it goes. Ikthal. You ready? A further contradiction. Chapter 17, verse 88. Say, verily, though mankind and the jinn, if all of mankind and the jinn, the genies, come together, should assemble to produce the like of this Quran, they could not produce the like thereof, though they were helpers one of another. So the Quran says, no genie, no jinn can produce something like the Quran. But hold on. In chapter 18, verse 50, we are told Satan is a jinn, a genie. Chapter 18, verse 50. And remember when we said unto the angels, fall prostrate before Adam, and they fell prostrate, all except Iblis, that's the name of Satan. He was one of the jinn. He was a genie. So he rebelled against his Lord's command. Will you choose him and his seed for your protecting friends instead of me when they are an enemy unto you? Calamitous is the exchange for evildoers. Now, guys, I'm confused. If Satan is a jinn, a genie, that means he could never produce something like the Quran. But according to Islam's earliest and most reliable sources, Satan inspired Muhammad to recite verses praising the daughters of Allah as intercessors whom Allah accepts. And he had him recite them in a way that resembled the Quran so that Muhammad his followers, and all the pagans thought these were Quranic verses because they sounded exactly like the rest of the Quran so that Satan was able to produce something identical to the Quran to the point that he got Muhammad, Muhammad's followers, and the pagans thinking these were Quranic verses from Gabriel. How was Satan able to produce something identical to the Quran when he's a jinn and the Quran tells us no jinn could produce anything similar to the Quran. You see, if you learn this material, if you take the articles rebuttals I gave you in the description box, and Lord willing, when this session is over, I'll pin them as a comment. If you read them carefully, reread them, watch and rewatch this session and seek the Holy Spirit's face, to enable you to understand the arguments perfectly, correctly, and then to pass them on accurately without mistake, we will see Islam destroyed and these dogs of Satan barking and running from the battle because all they can do is murder us because they can't refute us because we have the truth and the truth is the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit and the Bible is their truth preserved by the Spirit and you cannot refute the truth. This is why the truth of Christ is destroying Muhammad and the Quran. And Muhammad's got Allah. All glory for the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone got it now? Everyone got it? Did you understand? Did you understand the satanic verses are established according to Islamic historiography? According to Islam's own criteria, these are sound traditions. They happen. Even Ibn Taymiyyah accepted it. 
Don't let this slob, this coward, fibbin, this illiterate donkey, jackass, brain ass, coward, who's only a man when he got his jihadi buddies with swords to behead people and rape women like his prophet who's burning in hell, thank the Lord Jesus, deceive you. He's a liar like his prophet and his prophet's father, Satan. It is based on solid traditions. Learn these facts and use them to glorify Jesus Christ by exposing Muhammad so Muslims wake up and know that their prophet is of the devil and that even according to their Quran, their prophet is burning in hell because he committed shirk knowingly. Right? So that said, I will do Shabrali separately. Maybe tomorrow, Lord willing, I'll do something on Shabrali because it's over two hours and I want us to go support Hussein Meshni. He's live. Yeah. Father, Spirit, rebuke buffering in the name of the Lord Jesus. Rebuke Satan in Jesus' almighty name. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. He's live, so let's go to his channel, brethren. Hit the subscribe button. If you haven't, hit the like button. Share these links. Share the articles. Pray for more viewers to learn these facts so we can have more soldiers sold out for the glory of Christ. Pray for my daughters and I, even their mother, that God gives us perfect health. Perfect strength, perfect vigor. Give my throat perfect health so that my voice never gives out. Ask the Lord Jesus to grant my daughters, their mother and myself, perfect, miraculous, divine, physical safety and protection. Ask the Lord Jesus to grant their mother repentance, to fear the Lord and get right. My daughter's salvation, to know Jesus and love Jesus. Ask the Lord to give me the power to remain holy and truly love Jesus and worship Jesus and obey Jesus. And do pray for the support. Steady support doesn't decrease so I can do the work the Lord wants me to do until Jesus summons me or until he returns. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and do pray I stay healthy and keep the weight off for the glory of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Cover us by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Enable us to love you the way you deserve to be loved and remain faithful. Never betray the Lord Jesus. But love him more than this world. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And Jesus is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Go to Hussein Meshni's channel. Lord willing, I will do Shabir Ali either tomorrow or over the weekend if the Lord wills. I hope you're blessed. I hope you're challenged. I hope you're strengthened. May he sit and throne upon our hearts. We love you, Son of God. Take care.